أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما اللهم افتح لنا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا ونفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم Alhamdulillah, the section that we're on now is on the mu'ajizat of the Prophet ﷺ. And the, the mu'ajizat is an area that for some reason a lot, a lot of the modern Muslims, there was a movement in the late 19th century to almost downplay the miracles of the Prophet Sallallahu to the point where uh, the, even, even certain things in the Qur'an were explained away. So it's important to note that this, the Orthodox tradition, both the Shia and the Sunni uh, traditions have always recognized the mu'ajizat of the Prophet Sallallahu there's in some of the modern books you read that the only mu'jiza of the Prophet Sallallahu is the Quran, uh, which is more appealing to the modern uh, mind. Uh, there's there's really almost a denial of miracles. Hume is wrote an essay uh, in which he argued that it was more likely that the person who narrates a miracle is lying than an actual miracle occurred. And that, that was his argument against miracles because the, the break in the chain of events, what's called khariqun al-ada, you have a ada or uh, the norm. That's a break in our chain of events. Yeah. Oh, it's from next door? Yeah. <laughs> Honey and Lahum, you know. Maybe we shall go and. Um. <laughs> so the uh, the 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 Kharikun al Ad is a break in the chain of events. There, there's natural cycles, and the Sunan of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala we believe in, that there are natural cycles. But there's also, we believe, suspension of those cycles and also divine intervention of those cycles. And I think that's where the Muslim uh, and also the other Abrahamic faiths, and even within the, if you get into the Eastern traditions, they're very much aware of these things. Also, they might interpret them differently, but they're aware of them. One of the also interesting things about miracles is much of what is being understood in modern physics in quantum mechanics is actually revealing the possibilities of these types of breaks in chains of events so it's very interesting that a lot of modern physicists are very much aware of possibilities what the Arabs used to say uh, I mean, they still, people that study the tradition say this, but the Arabs used to say, Ja'izun aqlan. You know, it's, it's rationally possible. So it is possible for, for instance, we can conceive, there's a tasawwur in the mind of a person being in two places at one time. It's certainly not something that we experience as a natural occurrence. But the idea of its possibility is even acknowledged in physics today, in modern physics. So this is the point, is that miracles are things that, that we believe are actually rationally, conce they're conceivable. They're not impossible. They are conceivable. Unlikely, yes. Highly improbable, yes. But impossible, that is where we differ. Now once you also recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is qadirun ala kulli shay, and you accept the premise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an interventionist God, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a deistic God, is not divorced from His creation. That there's an idea in the enlightenment period of a deistic God that 
in essence, God created the, the world, the universe, set up a, a system of laws, Newtonian physics types laws, and then left the universe to its own deterministic un, unraveling. The Muslims believe, actually, if you get into serious aqidah tradition, the Muslims don't even believe in causation, that the, 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 uh, the dominant view of our scholars is that there is no secondary causation, that everything is actually an act of God. And this is what I yuqta'u yuqta'u bis-sikkini wa mithruhu yuqta'u fi tashkhini fa inna fi'ruhu lahu bi wasita ahaluhu ulul uqur al-dabita You don't say the, the knife cuts, you don't say the fire burns because that his action should have a medium or a means by which it is actuated is something the people of, of great intellect have rejected. So, uh, and to explain that is that when, if you take a knife, a surgeon takes a knife and puts it to the skin, it, and th this is something also Hume acknowledged. Hume uh, recognized that it is only the human mind that associates cause and effect because it sees certain things happen again and again, so it assumes where there's smoke, there's fire. But what he realized is it's only a habit of the mind. This is something the Muslims knew long before Hume ever worked that out with the billiard table. He, uh, the, the Muslims, uh, the, 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 the theologians of Islam said that when the surgeon's knife touches the skin, Ajr Allah adatuhu. Allah has made his the normative and natural phenomenon that there's a cutting. But the reality of it is it's an act of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So everything is an action of Allah, immediate. And this this is closer to a quantum understanding of, of the universe, the Newtonian physics, the old physics, which is valid in terms of observation. When you look at the world, the world is working according to Newton's laws. But when you start delving a little deeper, getting beyond, suddenly those laws start breaking down. This is where the human mind is perplexed. So you have chaos theory, you have ideas about the universe that uh, a, a randomness. I mean, there's a lot of different views about trying to make sense of this. But what we understand from it is that it is actually, and the non-deterministic view, the fact that, that you know, a lot of modern scientists are arguing that you cannot truly predict anything because there are just too many variables in any given uh, situation is very consistent with our belief. لا يعلم الغيب إلا الله. Nobody knows what is going to happen except Allah. You can work out probabilistically what will happen, but you cannot determine with, the, when it, with any absolute certainty about what will happen in any given situation. So, and the same is true for fire. يا نار كوني بارد والسلام. Oh fire, be cool and safe for Ibrahim when Ibrahim was thrust into the fire. That is not a suspension of an intrinsic power in the fire. It's actually an articulation of the reality that the fire has no power in and of itself, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it his sunnah. When you put your hand into the fire, it burns. The reality of it is it's Allah creating that action in that instant. So we believe that he is, that Allah is the khaliq in every instant. He's muhi mumit. There's like an on-off cycle in, in the creation. This is the aqidah of the, the vast majority of our scholars, that there is an on-off cycle going on. So that what you're seeing, if you look at, at a film, which is a good metaphor for this, uh, film works based on frames. It's a type of sleight of hand, so it's really a kind of magic. Um, and it used to be called the Magic Lantern. The first films were actually called the Magic Lantern. The film, if you look on, a, on, the, on the frame, between the frames, there's a little black area. Each frame has a black area between it. Well, as the frame's going through the projector and the projector is projected onto the screen, you don't see that black frame. 
it appears to you that it's a consistent uh, movement. So there's whatever you're watching, uh, it, it, you don't see any break in the chain of frames. That is how the Muslims explained the world. That the world is actually a recreation in every instant, but in the off cycle, it's so fast that we don't see it. It's so fast that we don't see it. So Allah is literally muhi wa mumit in every instant. Allah is creating and, and destroying the cosmos in every instant, recreating it. So everything is an act of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything is an act of Allah. And what, what Imam al-Junaid termed fana is to experience the black between the frames. To see the, 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 the basic insubstantiality of existence for one moment. And to realize that Allah is al-hayy al-qayyum. That Allah is the qayyum. That he is the single sustaining force behind existence in every instant. And if he removes his qayyumiya, all of existence is gone. It's, it's over. And that is why in every instant, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is immediate and present in his creation. So what a miracle is, is simply a suspension of that chain of events. It's like cutting a frame out and putting another frame in. And so all of these things, when you have an aqidah like that, become possible. They're not even far-fetched. They're far-fetched for people that are living in a Newtonian world, that believe in the world of cause and effect. That, that's when they become far-fetched. But when you understand how existence works, even theoretically, so not everybody experiences these things, but there are people that have experienced them, and these experiences are oddly enough consistent in most religious traditions. In most mystical religious traditions, they pretty much have come to the same conclusions about reality, which is very strange, which is why some of the uh, physicists became very interested in mystical tradition, like Buddhism and things like this, because they started seeing such similarities between the very things that they were beginning to understand about theoretical uh, models of how the world actually works as opposed to experiential uh, explanations based on our normative experience. And they started seeing these similarities. So uh, it's, it's very fascinating. So this subject is, is an interesting subject uh, and something that unfortunately uh, some modern Muslims have trouble with. I certainly don't. Um, but uh, anyway, that was a preface to this uh, section. بيان بعض معجزات المصطفى صلى عليه ربنا وشرفا. This is a clarification of only some of the miracles of the chosen one. And his miracles are actually quite extraordinary because he had miracles throughout his life. He had irhasat, the things before the actual revelation came. من هذا القرآن المعجز الذي بحر إعجازه كل العقور وقهر. First among them is the miraculous Qur'an, the nature of which overwhelms due to its incapacitating eloquence and meanings. All the intellects that examine it are conquered by. Now, unfortunately, for most people, this miracle is simply not accessible. The Arabs at the time the Qur'an was revealed had been prepared for the Qur'an. There's anybody that looks at this has to marvel at the timing of the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an comes at a time when the bulagha, these eloquent masters of, of Arabic, and the ability, nobody, if you read Yahali poetry, nobody in the history of the Arabic language was more adept at descriptive language, at, at just perfect language to describe something. So when they described the desert sands, they gave descriptions that you cannot improve on. They had a rhetorical prowess that was unmatched in the history of the Arabic language. In the same way that one could argue that English reached its pinnacle during the time of the Elizabethan period. And nobody has come up with 
poetry that is the equivalent of Donne or Shakespeare or a little bit later, Milton, uh, his period. But that, that period of the English language is unparalleled. Uh, the, the next closest thing is probably some of the 19th century writers. But uh, English now has fallen on hard times. I mean, there just aren't very many uh, eloquent uh, writers anymore in English, and what passes for great writing is is quite uh, quite extraordinary. So if you look at English literature, you will see that that, that every great l language has a period of time when it it just reaches its its uh, culminating uh, apex. Uh, Persian language is like that with the great P Persian poets who are also around the same time. The, um, the Greek language during, during the period of, uh, of Homer, uh, and then also later to a certain degree during Plato's period. So the Arabs, this language had reached this pinnacle and right at the, and what's fascinating is almost all of the Jahadi poets die right before Islam comes. And then there's nobody to parallel, uh, parallel them after Islam. There's great poets, Abu Nuwas and Ibn Burda and and uh, and Mutanabbi. I mean, there's great poets, but none of them can compare to Imr al Qais or Labid or Nabigh al Dibyani. Uh, none of them. So when the Quran came down and the Arabs heard it, these were people that were speaking in their normal language, the language that they obtained from their mothers. And all you have to do is read the, 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 the Arab, the Arab, the Bedouins who relate hadith. Just anybody who studied Arabic, for you who study Arabic, look at the hadith of Halima Sa'diya. Look at the way she speaks. Look at the hadith of Aisha bint Abi Bakr. Look at, look at the hadith of Umm Zara. Look at some of Aisha's khutab. Aisha knew all of the Jahali poetry by rote. Muawiyah once asked one of his uh, boon companions, Nadim, who, who's the most eloquent person you've ever heard? He said, well, I enter ya Amir al muminin You know, you are. And he was very eloquent. And he said, I want you to be honest with me. He said, well, in that case, <laughs> he said, I've never heard anybody more eloquent than Aisha, the daughter of a Siddiq. And if you look at Aisha's speeches, they're stunning expressions of the Arabic language. These people could do this naturally. It was not, there was no takalluf in their speech. They weren't, they didn't have to sit down and write speeches and, and work out rhetorical artifices and uh, tropes and figures, uh, you know, to, to impress people. All of that came later. When they, when they examined their language, they said, oh, this is, this is called antithesis. This is called, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is genas, here's alliteration. Those were all, they came later. They were doing this naturally. They didn't need to study rhetoric to learn how to do these things. They got them from their mother tongue. So when these people first heard the Quran, they, they were overwhelmed by it. They, first of all, they said, this is not the speech. This is not something we've heard before. They had three types of language. They had nathar, which is prose. They had saja, which is almost like what, what we call today rap. It's, 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 it's not poetry, but it's using a lot of rhyme, and, uh, and, and the Arabs liked it in their khutab. The, the, uh, the, the kahinas used to use it. These, these soothsayers used to do it. Um, and it, it, it's, it, it almost sounds a little bit... Um, you know, subterranean homesick blues. It, it just sounds uh, a little bit like uh, somebody's just trying a little too hard. But the, uh, and then the third was shi'r. And then shi'r had what were called abhur, which are the, the bahar, the meters. And, and they had, their meters were qualitative. They were of time duration and the Arabs could do this naturally. And this is why you have Arab poets that could just say a poem without any 
difficulty, completely spontaneous, uh, sp spontaneous. Many, many examples of this. And uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya is very, very capable of doing that. He, he, can, he can say something in, uh, in meter. It, just like uh, uh, people that really master Shakespeare have no difficulty uh, uh, extemporaneously speaking in iambic pentameter, which is a natural uh, form of speech, but it's only one bahar. These people could do many, many of these uh, meters. So the Arabs, uh, when they heard the Quran, they said, this is, a, this is a sahir. And the reason they said he was a magician was because they saw the effect it was having. It was like a magic on people. People were becoming mesmerized by it. Even people that didn't really, weren't interested. The Quraysh, at one point, they were giving people cotton to put into their ears when they went into the haram because they did not want people to hear the Quran because they knew they'd get influenced. And some of these people would go in and they'd just take it out to listen because they, you know, curiosity killed the cat. So they, they would do that and, and people became Muslim that way. The woman in Nasi man yashri lahu al hadith li an sabili la you know, amongst the people are those who purchase empty, vain talk. When, when they used to go listen to the Prophet, one of the Quraysh got some per, uh, Persian storytellers that used to tell the, the like stories of the Persian kings to sit on the road to try to distract people, uh, to give them stories about things. So they were very worried about the impact that this was having on them. Even at Walid ibn uh, Mughira, who was the, the father of Khalid, Al-Walid was, was one of the most eloquent of the Quraysh, and when, when he heard the Quran, he was overwhelmed by it. And he, he said that this, this Quran is, is, is just something very, very uh, captivating. And, and it was uh, Abu Jahal convinced him, you know, he's, his magic's getting to you. But he almost became Muslim just from hearing the Quran. Fasda' bima tu'mar, when one of the Arabs came into the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the haram, he heard the Prophet وسلم, reciting some verses, and he went into sajda. And somebody said, D did you become Muslim? He said, no, but I was compelled by the eloquence of that language just to do that. So this is the effect that this was having on them. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ generally would do. When, when people would come in and at, he would recite Qur'an to them. That's what he would do. Because that was the power that Allah had given him was, was in the, the message in form and content. Form and content. You can have content without form and you can have form without content. The West is, is, ha, has mastered... Uh, form without content. So people will go and watch a, a two-hour film and pay a lot of money, for, and there's nothing there. But the, the, the form is so magical. Really, the form is so magical that people will, will, will sit mesmerized uh, watching you know, cars blow up and do, because it's the form, but there's nothing there. It's empty, meaningless. And then you can have extraordinary content, but poorly produced, which is uh, another tragedy, because people tend to not be interested. If you see a book, it doesn't, I mean, I'll give you some really beautiful books published in Pakistan, um, in, in, and it's so hard to read them, because the, the typesetting is all words or, but if you actually, if they were produced really well, they're, they, they're really quite extraordinary books, some of these books that were written by the, uh, uh, some of these 19th and early 20th century scholars in Pakistan who really knew English quite well. I mean, it's, it's a little bit Victorian, uh, but they're, they're really quite extraordinary books, but they're hard to read for somebody who wants uh, to have nice content. So form and content is what is, is so masterful about the Qur'an and the impact that it has. So Qada Yad says about the Ijaz al-Qur'an that this, there are many types of Ijaz in the Qur'an. And he says uh, they're, 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 they're 
four major areas, but one thing is the the husnu ta'lif wal ti'amu karimihi wa fasahatuhu wa wujuhu ijazihi. It's the the way that it's put together, the syntactical structures of of the actual sentences. One of the things Abu Bakr al-Baqallani did in his book called I'jaz al-Quran is he took the Jahali poets, the great masters of poetry, and he showed how all of the Jahali poets have bad lines. There's no Jahali poet that did not have uh, what, what, what's called uh, you know, shi'r rakik, just poorly constructed shi'r poetry. But he's, he challenged anyone to find a rhetorically weak verse in the Quran. In other words, a verse that could actually be articulated in a better way than it's articulated in the Quran with the Arabic language. That is something stunning. Now, I, because I'm an editor um, and people that do editing, you know, I often read things and I think, mm, I would have said it differently or, you know, I mean, I'll edit while I'm reading things. Um, modern Arab writing is really hard for me to read because I've spent most of my life reading classical uh, writers who have just such a mastery of the language that it's hard to imagine that they could improve, you could improve on their language. So that's the thing about the, the highest level of editing gets to the point where you just can't improve on it. It would be hard to improve on it. But in any book that's ever been written, you will find things that can be improved on. It doesn't matter. Shakespeare, anybody. Shakespeare has doggerel in his uh, plays. So Abu Bakr al-Baqalani shows that the Quran does not have any rhetorically weak uh, language. It's just, if you, if you take the science of rhetoric, which is a science, and analyze the Quran, you won't come any. So that's the, and then ilti'amu kerimihi, the appropriate, one of the things about language, and this is why people enjoy listening to eloquent people, because when you hear really eloquent language, there's, it's more than just listening to the language uh, for meaning, but you actually enjoy hearing the types of words that are put together when there's real mastery uh, of speaking. And so even the, the letters that are used, even the letters that are used have meaning. I'll give you some examples. In the Arabic language, the word khafif, khafif, and thaqil, sanulqi alayka qawlan thaqila. Qaf is one of the heaviest words in the Quran. Qaf. Al-Quran. Qaf yadullu ala al-iltisaq, yadullu ala... Qaf is usually used in words yadullu ala intiha or qata or qa'ar. You know, the, the depths of something, the severing of something. It's a very strong word, which is why qata'a is a qaf, qata'a, uh, qadhafa, uh, qattara. I mean, many, many examples of that. In the, so the word thaqil, tha is a heavy word. Tha, qa, thaqil, it's heavy. Then nulqi, alayka. Qawlan, thaqilan. There's, it's actually heavy. So we will thrust upon you a weighty word. So even the choice of the letters in the Quran have uh, meanings. It's, 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 it's something uh, really amazing about the Quran. There are many, many examples of that in the Quran. قُطُوفُهَا دَانِيَةِ قُطُوفُهَا قَطَفَ To pick something, to pull it off. قَا قُطُوفُهَا دَانِيَةِ دَانِيَةِ Dunu is close. قُطُوفُهَا قَطَفَ is usually difficult. And then دَانِيَةِ It's something that's close to you. قُطُوفُهَا دَانِيَةِ Dunya What's right, the closest thing to you. Dunu The... Uh, also, the muqatta'at, muqatta'at, these mystical letters that if you look 
somebody took all of the letters of the Quran that are mentioned uh, and uh, tried to assemble like a meaningful sentence from from these letters, the muqatta'at, Arif Lam Mim, Hamim Ayn Sin Qaf, uh, Arif Lam Mim Ra. And the, the only uh, sentence, that, one of, this is one of the Mufassirin, the only sentence that he could come up with was, Nasun Hakimun Qati'un Lahu Sir. Nasun Hakimun Qati'un Lahu Sir. That was the only and that has all the muqatta'at. Nasun hakimun qati'un lahu sir. A wise nas is nasr Quran, a wise revelation. Qati'un, absolute, lahu sir. It has a secret. That was the only one he could come up with. So even the muqatta'at, if you look at the muqatta'at, they're very strange. Who could think of that? To start a book with letters that nobody knows what they mean. Alif Lam Mim, Thalik Al Kitab, Thalik Al Kitab, Lit Ta'adim. That book, Thalik Al Kitab, Lit Ta'adim. La Raiba Fi. There's no doubt in it. That, that's the beginning of the book. Alif Lam Mim, you don't know what this means. So the first thing is if you're coming to this book with some pre conceptions about this book with your own intellect which is going to determine what you accept and what you reject you're not going to get anything this is guidance for people that are already aware of some type of sense of duty towards their Lord it's not going to benefit you if you go to the book with your arrogance if you go to the book thinking that you know everything this book's not going to give you anything Arif Lam Mim. Nobody knows what that means. All the Mufassirun say, Allahu Ta'ala A'lam. God knows what it means. One of the things that we do know is that letters in, in, English, in, in, in uh, modern linguistics, phonemes are meaningless. Phonemes. They're meaningless. We don't believe that. We believe that even letters have meaning. We just don't know what they mean. But we believe they have meaning. In other words, it's meaning all the way down. All the way down to the phonemes. And the first language, the, which was probably called Syrianiya, was a language of, of just phonemes put together. Like ba-ba, boo-boo, ga-ga, which is why babies speak in those, the, the initial, which is called doubling in linguistics, this is the thing humans can do that animals can't do. We can put phonemes together and make words. And we do this out of 28, approximately. I mean, some languages have less than 28 and some have more, but there's not more than, I think it's like 45 or something sounds in any uh, given language. From these 28 letters, look what we can talk about. 28 letters. And look what we can articulate. We can talk about infinity. Infinity. Humans can, can conceptualize things that are even beyond uh, our limited intellect's capacity to experience, and yet we can conceptualize them. And the highest of that is the greatest non-conceptualization, which is divinity. The fact that we can conceive of God. Of, of that which is out of time and space, but is the creator of time and space, that has no form, that is pure consciousness, that has all knowledge, omniscient, uh, omnivalent, uh, omnipotent, that we can conceive of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is, is a miracle, and we conceive of God through language, because without language, we have no thought. We, without language, we have no thought. So the... the all of these things come together in the Qur'an. All of these extraordinary gifts of language. If you look, Ar-Rahman khalaq al-insan, Allama al-Qur'an khalaq al-insan, Allamuhu al-bayan. Ar-Rahman, Allama al-Qur'an. Ar-Rahman, the merciful, imprinted the Qur'an. Allama, in Arabic, the original 
uh, meaning of that was to imprint into sand or clay, to leave a alama. Now, the first writing was piercing into clay, right? The cuneiform writing. And this, this is what Allah has done with the human being. We've imprinted in us, this is what Chomsky understood that there is a universal grammar, that human beings, it is imprinted in us to learn language, that language is something that is intrinsic to our very humanity, that language is part of us, it's encoded in us. That, and this is why, wherever you grow up, you will learn the language of those people. If they're Chinese and you're from uh, Brooklyn and you're raised in a Chinese family, you're gonna speak Chinese. If you're a Chinese person and they raise you in Brooklyn, you're going to end up having a horrible American accent. No, I'm sorry. All the Brooklynese people, apologies. But the, th this is the reality, that we have the ability to learn language. It's imprinted. Allama al-Qur'an, khalaq al-insan, created the human being, allamahu al-bayan, imprinted in the human being was the ability to understand language. Quran and insan. Quran and insan. And between b between between these two is is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He's the one that gave the Quran to humanity. Revelation, the the the, the, re the receiver of the revelation, and then that receiver. This is communication. This is exactly how communication works. And so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam articulated this extraordinary book, the fasaha of the book. The, the, the fact that our, the letters have been preserved to the degree that, that they've been preserved. We know exactly how the Qur'an is, is, is recited. We know how the Prophet ﷺ recited it. We know how many beats on every letter. How? This is the preservation of this book. No other book has this preservation. <laughs> we have sent down this book and we have taken upon ourselves to preserve the book. If you go now to that matbah in Medina, subhanallah, look at what the preservation of this Quran, every Quran that you pick up in that, uh, in that masjid, all those hundreds of thousands of masahif are exactly the same, with no mistakes. That this has been going on for centuries. Imam al-Qurtubi, about this verse, if you look in his tafsir, a Christian man came in Andrusia, and he, he copied out a Bible and put mistakes in it on purpose. And he went to this Christian, and he was a calligrapher, master calligrapher, and it was a beautiful illuminated uh, Bible. And he showed the Christian, and he said, could you read this and, and tell me if it's good? And this was the great scholar of the Christian. And he read it, and he said, it's a beautiful gospel. And then he did the same with the Torah. He went to a Jew. It's beautiful. And he said, you didn't see anything wrong with it? No, it's beautiful. And then he did, wrote a mushaf and put mistakes in there. He took it to the, the, the Muslim scholar and he said, uh, could you read this and tell me what you think? And he said, we need to burn this. He said, why? He said, there's mistakes in it. And he knew. that Imam al-Qurtubi mentions this in his tafsir. He knew that it was preserved. No other religious book has been given the blessing of preservation that this book has been given. That is i'jaz, that the Qur'an says this book will be preserved. Tajweed, we know the makharij al huruf We know the 17 points of articulation. I know exactly where the qa emanates from. I know where the ha emanates from. I know where the lam emanates from. I know the attributes of these. We know what's ismat, we know what is mahmusa, we know the idlaq, we know the huruf, you know, the qalqala, we know these things. I know if you say al haq that you have qalqala, we know the kubra and the sughra. Why? How did this all get preserved? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised to preserve it. He promised his prophet this book would be preserved. This is a miracle alone, just the preservation of the Qur'an. And Muslims have really, unfortunately, a lot of them, they just don't understand uh, the incredible gift this community has been given in, the, in the, having a unified book and, the, and the, the preservation that the book has been given. So he mentions that, the fasaha of the book. Ijazuhu, the Qur'an, it's, وَرَكُمْ فِي الْقِصَاصِ حَيَا 
the Quran says with a few words what, what, what needs to be articulated in entire books. The commentaries of the few words of the Quran need, needs to be articulated, needs to be explained in, in entire books. A whole book can be written just on that one idea in the Quran. Many examples of that in the Quran. If you look at Al-Fatiha, Iltifat, in the, in the Quran you have what's called Iltifat, which is a rhetorical device in which you move from first person to second person to third person. This, this bedazzles Western people. They have a hard time, or rather befuddles them. They have a hard time reading the Quran because they say, well, wait a second, it just said you and now it's saying me and then it said uh, I and why. You, they can't see that. This is a, this is a, 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 a rhetorical device used in the Arabian language. And it, it's almost like a Zen koan to maintain concentration in people, but also it has secrets. Ibn, Qayyim, uh, Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi said, the Quran, if you look at the iltifat in al-Fatiha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins, when you begin Fatiha, according to Maliki, it's alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, it's in the hadith in al-Bukhari, qasamtu bayni wa bayna abdi al-Fatiha, or Fatiha al-Kitab, fa'idha qala abdi alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, that's how the hadith Qudsi begins the Fatiha. Allahu Akbar, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, al-Rahman al-Rahim, Maliki yawmi deen. That's all called, uh, it's, it's the ghaib, it's for, it's, Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, master of the day of judgment. That's all in the ghaibah. Um, it's, it's third person uh, way, way of speaking. And then, iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'een. That now you move to direct khitaba. So now you're in the khitab. So you move to second person. Iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'een. Then you move, ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. First person, ihdina. Right? Guide us to the straight path. Ihdina. So he said that this, that is the movement of Fatiha. When you enter into the prayer, your, your presence is not, it's not complete. But as you move in to the, the, the discourse with your Lord, the presence becomes stronger. You get to iyyaka na'budu. Now you're directly speaking to God. Iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'een. To you, you're speaking directly to God. You begin by speaking as if God is absent, and you end by speaking directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the, 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 uh, the ways in which the Quran uh, reveals itself, the masterful way in which the Quran is a vehicle for consciousness, for awareness of the divine. He says, um, and then also there are many other uh, aspects of, of the, uh, the, the Quran, the, the verses um, that deal with things that are from the unseen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, talks about غُرِبَتَ الرَّوْمْ fi adhana al-ard The Byzantines were defeated around the Dead Sea. There was a battle there. We now know the Dead Sea is literally the lowest point on the earth. fi adhana al-ard At the lowest point of the earth. The, uh, but they will, after being defeated, right, they will in turn defeat. Now, nobody at that time thought the Byzantines would defeat the Persians. So when Abu Bakr, when gambling was still permitted, because the Quran said, fi bad'i sinin, in a few years, and bad'i is between t uh, two and, and nine, he, uh, Abu Bakr uh, made a bet with the mushrikeen. And they, they laughed. They thought it was ridiculous because they knew how powerful the Persians were. They made the bet. They lost the bet. Now, one could argue, why, doesn't, why didn't God just say in 1066 the Normans are going to invade England? Because that really would have been a, a zinger. Right. Well, there are so many things in the Quran that, and, and I would recommend all of you to listen to Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayyaz, The Miracles of the Quran, if you get an opportunity, because it's really a stunning lecture, and I should really just direct you to that because it, it will suffice 
uh, as, a, as a lecture. But the Quran is never, ever, uh, it's just never that obvious. It's, it's, like, it's, it's like a poet um, does not want to, uh, people, some people just don't like poetry because they're like, well, if he meant that, why didn't he just say that? But that's, that's the point, is it's to force you into uh, the discourse of the book itself and, and to, to get you to come to your own conclusions about things. So the Qur'an demands a level of attentiveness and also uh, a level of uh, commitment. This is, this is the great commitment of your life, the Book of Allah. And it's a, very, it's a, it's a difficult book. It's, the Qur'an says that it's easy it's mubin, but it's mubin for the one that knows the language. If you don't know the language, it's by no means mubin. It's mubin, it's, it's Quran, it's, it's inna anzalnahu Quran and Arabian. You know, we reveal this as an Arabic Quran. It's, the Quran cannot be translated in that way. The meanings of the Quran will never be translated into any other language but Arabic because Arabic is the only language that and I was mentioning this earlier, that, that can contain these meanings. In the Rasm Uthmani, there were no uh, dots. And if you look at the seven Qira'at, there are different variant readings on placing the dots. So, that's one reading, فتبينوا. The other reading, which is a Qira'a Sab'iya, is فتثبتوا. Tathabatu. So the two readings, one is tabayyanu, the other is tathabatu. When anybody brings you news, there are two things that have to be ascertained in order for any veracity or possibility of accepting something uh, as a proposition that you can judge. The first is, is the source, is it really... If it, in, in, in uh, you have khabariya, you have word objective and a subjective. Objective statement, you can judge it. That's true, that's false. In a subjective statement, you can't. So the Arabs divide that into insha'iyya and khabariya. If it's a khabar, and that's what Allah is talking about, in ja'aka fasiqun bi naba'in, bi khabarin. If he comes with some khabar, which is basically an objective statement, uh, there's, there's, there's people that are about to attack Medina. If I come and tell you, there's people that are about to attack Medina. That's an objective statement. It's not like, I think there might be. Uh, now it's just, why? Well, I have this feeling. This is subjective. That, that, that you, you, you know, I, I don't feel well. That's a subjective statement. You cannot objectively ascertain the truth of that statement unless you're me. Like I could be lying, I could be telling the truth, but in the end of the day, you cannot. Now, when the Quran says, فَتَبَيَّنُوا فَتَثَبَّتُوا It means make sure that this is true, thabit. Make sure it's actually happening. When it says, تَبَيَّنُوا Make sure you understand what it means. This is what Al-Mutanabbi said, وَكَمْ عَائِبًا قَوْلًا صَحِيحًا وَأَفَاتُوا فِي الْفَهْمِ السَّقِيمِ how many times does somebody find fault in something and the fault is in his own understanding? Like uh, Sayyidina Ali, it's a riwayah, it's probably, uh, it's, it's in the books of Adab. But, أَصْبَحْتُ كَافِرًا, you know, أُصَدِّقُوا الْيَهُودُ وَالنَّصَارَى I woke up a kafir believing in Jews and Christians and then he was toiling that day. The earth, a kafir is a farmer. And أُصَدَّقَ الْيَهُودُ وَالنَّصَارَى The قَادَةَ النَّصَارَى قَادَةَ الْيَهُودُ لَيْسَ النَّصَارَى عَلَى شَيْءٍ The Jews say the Christians aren't following the truth. The Christians say the Jews aren't following the truth. So you believe the Jews and the Christians about that. Anyway, there's examples of that. When, many examples of somebody says something, you have to ascertain whether you really know what they're saying. I'll give you an example of my own experience. Um, I was interviewed right after 9-11 and I said if there were any uh, martyrs they would be the, the firemen. So some people went to Sheikh Abdullah bin Bay and they said that I said the firemen were shuhada. And he said what exactly did he say? And, th and they said, he said, لو كان هناك شهداء. Sheikh said, لو حرف امتناع امتناع. هذا صحيح. 
You know, like in is a, is a, is a conditional uh, sentence. If there is, then there. You have to have, a condition has to be fulfilled before. That's, that's language. So people would say things, but they're not really looking at the language itself. What, what exactly does that mean? And that's part of the problem with modern people, is people haven't studied language. People don't know grammar. And, and they want to give you fatwas. Seriously, there's people who don't know grammar. I was in uh, San Francisco. This is a true story. And this man, he's an imam and gives fatwa and everything. When, when we were uh, having some discrepancies about the time of Dhuhr, the way I was taught is to measure the shadow. And the shadow in Maliki, you have to see a, a, a physical increase in the shadow. But it, for the first 10, 15, 20 minutes, depending on where you are on the earth, you won't see any. Now, there is actually movement of the sun away, but you won't see it physically. So anyway, we were talking about it, and I said to this, this man, you know, he, he, I mean, this literally teaches uh, Islam and everything. And I said to him, and I was with Tarif al-Urabi, and, and I said to him, well, have you ever actually measured, a sh you know, the shadow? He said, no, nah, no. Nah. I said, where? He said, oh, when I was in Yemen, I said, um, how, how'd you do it? And he said, uh, bil, bil an, uh, bil, You know, I said, bil anza. He said, nah, bil anza. And I said, like, ha? he said, a sunnah, bil anza. And I said, uh, what do you mean? Like, he said, kunna na'khud al anza wa al I said, didn't the anza move? And he said, la, kunna nuthabbituha. You know, we'd hold it down. And at that point, I just got up. We said, we have to go. And I said to Tarif, he just looked at me. He said, subhanAllah. Because the hadith says, Bilal used to take an anaza with fatha over the noon, which is a stick. Anza is like a sheep. So this guy read the hadith. I knew he was lying to me. Literally. I knew nobody in Yemen would do that because they're just not that stupid. But, <laughs> you know, this, this, is what, this is what you're dealing with. With people now who, you know, who haven't studied the language and they're reading hadith and, and, and they think they understand this stuff. This language is really difficult. It's, it's terrifying to translate, to be teaching. You know, people should be petrified of this stuff. Just aqidah alone is just such an immense responsibility. So the, uh, the Qur'an is, is, a, is, is a very... Uh, Difficult book if you if you don't know the language there are many subtleties of the language and I'll, I'll give you one of my favorite examples Qawm in the Arabic language is is people whose fathers are from a group so your Qawm are your patrilineal side of the family It's not your matrilineal the matrilineal is not called a Qawm so when you say uh, you know, man qawmuka, they say, ana dhibyani, my qawm is dhibyan. That means my father was a dhibyani, so I'm a dhibyani. In the Quran, when the prophets speak to their people, they say, ya qawmi, inni rasulullah ilaykum, I'm a messenger, ya qawmi ma biya safaha, oh, my people, I'm not foolish. You look in the Quran, they always say, ya qawmi, oh, my people. Exception, Isa ibn Maryam. Isa ibn Maryam says, Ya Bani Israel. He's the only one of the prophets when he directs his people, he says, Ya Bani Israel. Why? Because in Arabic, they're not his qawm. Because his mother was from them, but he had no father from them. So he's the only one that says, Ya Bani Israel. Inni Rasulullah ilaykum. Many examples of the, the linguistic miracles of the Quran. The, uh, if, we, if we got into the, you know, there's I'jaz al-adadi, the numbers, the miraculous numbers of the Qur'an, the, the number that words are mentioned, uh, certain words that are mentioned certain amount of times. Uh, also, you have the I'jaz al-ilmi, which is a real I'jaz. There are many things. I mean, one of the things that Bruno Guardadoni says, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Is that it? Guardadoni? Yeah. Um, who's a really brilliant... Uh, uh, astronomer, physicist, astrophysicist in France. One of the things that he said is that he found that the Quran was, 
in, in, the, in the religious traditions, it was the only one that as a scientist, he really felt that he could believe in it without having to relinquish his science. Because if you read the other traditions, there are so many things that you have to give up. But he felt that he could really be a scientist and actually believe in the book. So that's, that is by far the great uh, miracle of the Qur'an. And it's a, it's a mu'jiza mustamirra. It's with us until the end of time. Unlike the previous, if you look at the miracles of Jesus, his miracles are gone. Uh, he raised people from the dead. We believe in that. He walked on water. We believe in that. He did many things. But those miracles are gone. Now all we have is uh, narrations of those. And they don't even have isnad. The narrations outside of Islam. When you look at the New Testament, there's no isnad to Isa. It doesn't say, I heard so-and-so who heard so-and-so who heard so-and-so. It doesn't, Matthew doesn't tell you who he heard it from. Seriously. But he never met Jesus. So it's munqata. From, from our perspective, it, it doesn't have a chain. So the the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala If they got together all the ins and the jinn, they'll never bring the likes of this Quran. And this is tahaddi. That's why a mu'jiza is always coupled with a tahaddi, a challenge, to do the likes of it. So they, they, they could not do that. لَهُمْ مُقَرِّعِنَ عَلَى الْإِتْيَانِ With frightening force, they were asked to bring its likes. بِهِ وَهُمْ فُرْسَانُ هَذَا الشَّأْنِ In spite of the fact, they were the equestrian masters of the steed of eloquence. They, they were people that could do these things, but they couldn't do it when they attempted to do that with the Qur'an. وَقَدِمْ تَطَوْ مِنْهُ جَوَادَ السَّبْقِ وَأَحْرَزُوا عِنَانَهُ فِي النُطْقِ They had mounted countless times unequaled race horses with masterly control of the spoken words reins. بَلْ خَرَسُوا وَهُمْ أَلَدُّ الْلُدِّ إِنَّ عَنِ الدَّعْوَ مُمَحْضَ الْجُحْدِ But they fell dumb in its presence despite being its dogged enemy, left only with their claims they could imitate it. They said, oh, we could do that, although secretly they knew otherwise. فَعِنْدَ ذَاكَ أَمْرَ الْقُرْآنُ أَنْ تُضْرَبَ الْأَعْنَاقُ وَالْبَنَانُ Only then did the Qur'an command that their necks be struck as well as their fighting hands. These people were persecuting the Prophet ﷺ, but the Prophet was told to leave them alone, and he did nothing to them, despite their persecution. But once it was clearly established to these people that, that this was uh, from God, and they were in a state of juhud and inad, in complete uh, rejection, despite they knew it was true, and obstinance, holding on to their pride and their tribal traditions, at that point, the Prophet was given permission to fight them. Before that, he wasn't. And that's why Kufar and uh, in the seasons, I, there's an article I did, which is an abridged version of something I've been working on for a while, is who are the Kufar? The Kufar, are, the Quran says that they're sharru dawabin indallah, the worst peop, uh, creatures with God. And it says that they'll never believe. A kafir is somebody who will never believe. That's why most people that you meet in the West don't assume they're kafir. They have hukum al-kufr in terms of inheritance and all these things. But you don't know what they are. God knows what they are. So you have to be very careful with dealing with people there. But the Prophet was given permission to fight them at that point, and striking their necks and the banan in the Quran, they're told to strike either the neck or the fingers. The fingers would incapacitate them from fighting, and then, the, 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 then they're, you know, they, they can't fight anymore. But the neck was actually done as a mercy, because it's the quickest way to, to kill somebody in battle. So the, 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 the Mufassirun say that if you strike the neck, they die instantly. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, كتب الله الإحسان على كل شيء فإذا ذبحتم فأحسنوا الذبحة You know, the, everything has إحسان, the best way of doing something. So if you kill, kill in the best way. Even in killing, there should be إحسان. يحد الشفرة, they should sharpen the knife. Uh, and then give your uh, sacrificial animal repose um, and then it says what wonders it contains too many to enumerate not to mention its marvels 
لو لم يجي بآية سواه صلى عليه ربنا كفاه had this been the only miraculous sign that he came with it would have sufficed may our Lord grant abundant benedictions upon him لكنه أتى بما أعي البشر من معجزات بينات كالقمر but it was not indeed he performed miracles that left men dumbstruck from among his miracles like the splitting of the moon for instance in شق القمر اقتربت الساعة وان شق القمر you know, the, 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 the hour is drawing near and the moon was rent asunder. The, the Quraysh and outside of them, they said that, that it was Sihrun Mustamir because they went and asked people uh, outside of the vicinity of Mecca. But the Quraysh asked for a sign and the Prophet ﷺ pointed to the moon and the moon they saw was split and they saw the mountain come between the moon. Now, whether that was a physical, actual splitting of the moon, Allah Ta'ala Alam. But there is something called the split moon phenomenon in astronomy that does occur, and it's been noted. It was noted in England, uh, China, and different places. There's, there, there's a, uh, uh, it's, it's actually, it's like an optical illusion, but the moon will completely split and come together. Whether that was the case or whether Allah Ta'ala Alam, when the Quran, uh, speaks, it speaks phenomenologically. It does not speak, the Quran describes things as they appear to people and uses the language to articulate that whether or not that's the case or not. So the Quran talks about the, the setting sun, even though we know, right, that the, the, it's the earth spinning around uh, that appear. We don't, you know, like the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the song from the 60s, the fool on the hill sees the, 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 the sun, the earth spinning round, and the, the, the fool on the hill sees the sun going down, but the eyes in his head see the earth spinning round. It, that's split, that's modern man, the split, the madness of modern man. You see the sun going down, but yet theoretically you understand that the earth is actually spinning around. That's modern man. And, and that's why you know, if you ask an engineer, why is it when the sun's going down, it appears uh, bigger than when it's up in the middle of the sky? Oh, that's because when it sets, they'll say, and then once they finish, you'll say, but does it actually set? Oh, well, no, it doesn't, but, you know, and then, see, so it's hard to get out of fitra experience of reality. No matter how hard you try, phenomenological experience overwhelms any theoretical knowledge that you have. And that's why the Quran speaks to people phenomenologically. Allahumma arin il ashya kamahiya. Show me things as kamahiya. Like they are, as they appear. Show me things as they appear. I was commanded to judge by the outward. Umirtu an ahkum bidhawahir. I was commanded to judge as things appear. There is a tajalli of God that is not God. Do you understand that? Allah is manifesting Himself on the world, but the world is not God. So there's a vahir, and then there's a batin, and they're different. But when Allah speaks, He speaks the, with the language of the Zahir. So the, the, the moon, ha, whatever it happened, Allah Ta'ala A'lam. Amantu Billah, I believe in it. Sadaqtuka Ya Rasulullah. We believe in His miracles. Allahumma salli alayka Ya Habibullah. Allahumma salli alayka. Wa ghasri qalbihi wa shakka sadri wa hashwihi bi sirri ay sirri or the washing of his heart and the splitting of his sternum and it's being filled with mysteries and what mysteries? Wa ji'a bir buraqi lil isra'i bihi ila al-aqsa min as-sama'i and also the buraq that was brought to him for his night ride to Jerusalem indeed to the heavens themselves the, the buraq even in the, uh, the commentary, they say, Summiya buraqan min al barqi li sur'ati sayrihi. It was called buraq because it's at the speed of light. I mean, where, where did they get that from? Subhanallah. The buraq moving from one horizon to the other in one instant. Subhanallah. So the buraq is one of the great miracles. And, and then the mi'raj, when the mashhur is that the buraq took him 
to Jerusalem and then it was the Mi'raj, the ladder that he went up through the heavens. The ladder appeared like Jacob's ladder. Also the Jews believe in the ladder that, uh, uh, you know, that there is a la- it's like a wormhole. You know, there's some kind of opening into the unseen. But the ladder appeared before the Prophet ﷺ and he was taken up. Not Sa'ida, the Mirqat. It's not he wasn't moving. He was he was just taken up. And the Prophet ﷺ went with Jibreel at each heaven. He the angel who was guarding the heaven said, Abu Itha, is he sent? And he said, Mananta, Jibreel, Waman Ma'ak, Muhammad Abu Itha, was he sent? These are like always people. When you go into a country, the people, the passport people, they don't trust you. They don't know who you are. They assume that might be, you know, and they're, they're usually kind of rude for some reason. But that's their job. And that's their job. And that was the job of those angels at the doors. Who are you? Jibreel. Who's with you? Muhammad Sallallahu Abu Itha? Naam. Come in. At each plate, this is Jawaz. The Prophet ﷺ said, لَن يَدْخُلَ جَنَّ أَحَدُكُمْ إِلَّا بِجَوَازٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ It's a hadith Salman writes, No one will enter paradise except with a passport. مَكْتُوبٌ فِيهِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ أُدْخُلُوهَا بِسَلَامٍ آمِنِينَ This is a hadith. So the people of dunya, all these, like people, لا يغرنك تقلب الذين كفروا في البلاد Don't be deluded by people that can go wherever they want. I mean, think of that ayah in relation to Muslims in the Muslim world that can't travel anywhere. They're stuck. If you're a Mauritanian, your passport doesn't help you very much. But people if they have an American passport, Canadian passport, British passport, you can go wherever you want, right? But in, in Akhirah, American passport, no benefit. French passport, no benefit. But that Mauritanian that couldn't even afford to get the passport, he has a jawaz from God. Udkhuluha bi salam and aminin. Walillahi al-mathir al-ala. You know, all these realities of dunya are going to be manifest in the Akhirah, but in a completely different way than they are in this world. Everything. King tyrants will be raised up like ants, people will be stepping on them. Just like they stepped on people in this world like they were ants. That's how they treated people in this world. Just like they were ants. You know, but on Yom Qiyamah, those people are going to, that's going to be their reality. So all of these things. This is, now he's out of Hajar Burda. He's, he's starting to follow the Sarayta min al harami laylan ira harami. كَمَا سَرَى الْبَدْرُ فِي دَاجٍ مِنَ الظُّلُمِ وَبِتَّ تَرْقَ حَتَّى إِلَىٰ أَنْ نِلْتَ مَنْزِرَةً مِنْ قَابِ قَوْسَيْنِ لَمْ تُدْرَكْ وَلَمْ تُرَمِي That you were moving across the, the, the sky like the full moon moves across the night sky in this midst of this and until you achieved a manzira a station with God that had not been achieved before. Qaba Qawseini or Adana. It's an amazing event, this thing. So the Prophet uh, achieved this maqam with his Lord. Habahu dul izzati bil maqami fiha wa bil ru'yati wal kalami. The, the, uh, the magnificent God of might selected him for that station of nearness in that celestial place to have the beatific vision and divine audience. An audience I'm using there to, in its original meaning because it comes from a Latin word, audio, to hear. So an audience is where you're, you get to, to listen. And, uh, so the, the, and that's, there's a khilaf about that, about seeing and hearing what that means. But bila uh, kayf, we say without any modality, Allah Ta'ala A'lam, we believe in the ru'ya, and in that Allah heard the speech of God uh, without any means like this. وَفَرَضَ الْخَمْسِينَ ثُمَّ خَفَّفَ عَنَّا بِهِ لِخَمْسَةٍ وَضَعَّفَ 
So God prescribed 50 prayers and later relented, easing up on us for the Prophet's sake. They became five with the reward of 50. Its reward included increasing the spiritual aid manifold out of divine bounty despite his lessening their numbers. The best of messengers then led the other messengers in prayer, returning to his home before the end of the night. In, in, in some riwayah, he led the prayer twice, on the earth and in heaven. And he, he met different prophets at different, the Isa uh, and Zakaria he met in the second heaven. He met uh, Idris in the fourth heaven. He met Harun and Musa, the fifth heaven. He met Ibrahim, Ibrahim in the seventh heaven. And then he went to the Sidrat al-Muntaha. What's interesting about the low tree of the furthest limit is that in the Asian traditions, which were not here in the, in the peninsula, but in the Asian traditions, the lot tree is the symbol in their tradition, in, in both Buddhism uh, and some of the Chinese traditions, the lot tree is the point beyond which rational understanding stops. So this is an ancient uh, metaphor for, when I don't want to say metaphor, you get into trouble, but it's an ancient symbol of something beyond which we cannot comprehend. The Prophet went beyond what is, is capable for human comprehension, entering into the divine presence, which is neither time nor place. And it's important to understand that there's no time or place with God. So, and it's, it's a testimony to the genius of our scholars that they really recognize that. Um, anyway. <laughs> This, it's intoxicating stuff. Um, it's late. People need to get up for Fajr. And so, inshallah, I'm going to really try to get through this. Um, I might end up just reading it, but it really needs more time than we had. So, Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.